Okay, roots and shoots, the t- Diplodia tip blight. So we're going to kind of go over conifers and evergreens, kind of things that have been on my mind uh, when I got started on this little project. Um, one of the neatest things is that uh, when we get into uh, plant health care is um, proper plant ID. In after 40 years of being in the business, it's still kind of amazing sometimes how we misidentify certain things. Uh, another thing that you know we talk to when we talk to um, – homeowners or we field questions in the field is that everything's a pine tree. So that spurred me into looking a little bit deeper into understanding uh, some of the names that we use on a daily basis and a regular basis and being able to identify uh, more accurately in the field for proper uh, insects and disease diagnostics. So we know that um, not all uh, evergreens are conifers. So if you think about a few of the plants that are evergreens that aren't conifers, uh, a couple of them come to mind right away. Uh, a boxwood would be an evergreen that uh, is always um, always green, but not considered a conifer. Azaleas, hollies, uh, plants like that. And then not all conifers are evergreens. So we look about, there's a few uh, that I deal with on a regular basis, which would be uh, the Dawn Redwood, maybe a Tamarack or a Larch. So being that they're still conifers, uh, they're not evergreens. Uh, and one thing that we're talking about today with the Pelodia is that not all conifers have noticeable cones. And something I learned right away uh, recently is that uh, you think about one specific uh, plant that's listed as a conifer, that isn't is actually the um, ginkgo tree. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I was not aware that that was underneath conifer. So for today's uh, focus on on the conifers, we're going to do uh, cones, needles, trachids, and resin ducts. As we all know, that if you guys ever pruned a, a resinous conifer uh, during the growing season, what a pain in the butt that can be. And with that said, that same problem is a problem when we try to do a trunk injection. So I ran into all kinds of fun things, so we're going to kind of talk about that. All right. Yes, Scott, good point. Uh, looks like everybody kind of muted their microphones, so it turns out pretty good. I'll try to turn mine up, um, or I'll talk a little bit closer. How's that? Is that a little bit better? Can you guys hear me? Perfect. Thanks, Dominic. All right, so let's kind of get into the next one. Uh, so some of the the things that I deal with up here, and I'm in the Detroit, Michigan area. So in the Midwest, uh, my territory is actually the Great Lakes states in Canada. So I deal with uh, a lot of these were coming up as problems in the urban landscape. One of the biggest things that I have right now in Michigan and uh, surrounding states is pitch mass borer. It's about every blue spruce that we have has this uh, insect in it. Zimmerman pine moths getting bad. Obviously, the Pelodia, which is the, one of the mainstays of what we're going to talk about today. Cytospora is getting worse again. Needle cast and Phomopsis. So those last four diseases, believe it or not, we're finding all four of those on specific trees, which we're going to talk about later. What's, what, what did this all get going? So... About six years ago, I got a, a question from Dr. Dennis Fulbright of Michigan State. Uh, he was having an issue with Phomopsis on spruce trees in the nursery. So I'm like, all right, well, let's start injecting um, some of these resinous conifers to see what time of efficacy we got. So as you can see um, on these evergreens in a nursery setting, what a pain in the butt it is to get underneath here. Um, our first thought was we had to get it during the growing season to get great uptake. But because you got great uptake, you also have great resin pressure. So we found out very early that injecting an evergreen during the growing season isn't the funnest, greatest thing. So we had to kind of doctor ourselves up, put these big suits on. It was probably about 75 degrees and sweat our, our rear ends off, crawling up underneath these trees and trying to get them treated. So after we got this started, uh, we started to get some good results on some of the compounds that we were putting in here. 
So Phomopsis, if you look, you know, the telltale uh, shepherd's crook, and we had to come up with a way to determine if the compounds that we infused into these trees were actually effective. So the first time we went out there, we actually flagged uh, symptomatic uh, shoots. Then we infused the trees, injected, and then we had to go back the following year and see, did that disease uh, continue to spread? So just as we started to get some of this data collecting, um, <laughs> Dr. Fulbright, re Fulbright re retired, and that, uh, that process or that little program actually came to a halt. So I'm like, all right, no problem. So we learned some great stuff for that. So then we went into um, a great discussion. Uh, if any of you guys have ever been on Michigan State University's campus, um, I do a lot of work with the uh, now retired campus arborist, Paul Schwartz. And we we're talking about some of the issues we had and some of the issues is he's having on campus. And the number one thing that he was still struggling with was actually Austrian pines in Diplodia on campus. So I'm like, well, all right, well, let's, um, why aren't you try injecting them? And he's like, well, we don't. What they were still doing as of five years ago on campus, they would have to have a spray crew come out at two to three o'clock in the morning to treat these trees in the spring during candle elongation. So I asked Paul, I says, well, what if we can do something to figure out if uh, trunk injection is a viable option on campus so you don't have to continue to bring your crews in on that late. So we got the permission, uh, Paul Schwartz and I, um, I pitched it to Arborjet, our head of research, uh, Joe DeCola. We're like, let's give it a go. So we did an inventory. Again, he had 400 um, spruce trees on campus they were worried about, but they weren't ready to let me uh, switch everything over to trunk injections. So what we did is we uh, contacted Forest Acres Golf Course. They had probably 200 Austrian pines on the golf course that they weren't doing anything with. They weren't being sprayed, uh, injected, or anything, and they were just kind of letting them do their thing. So after we inventoried the trees, uh, rated the trees from 1 to 5, uh, and we'll kind of see, uh, this will all make sense when I show you some of the statistics uh, near the end, we picked trees uh, as five being near death and one being uh, a premier specimen. We picked anything that was two to two and a half or better for the study. And then we started. So this is a, a very, very interesting picture. And if you look, uh, this was my very first end of June, beginning of July, tree IV injection in an Austrian pine on campus. So beautiful day, you know, we think about trunk injection on the deciduous tree. We think about uh, transpirational pull, uh, getting product in the, in the xylem and using that, that whole uh, process to pull product through the canopy. So I thought, well, that's a perfect time to inject these. Well, guess what? Uh, with great flow, a great soil moisture, um, comes with, in resinous conifers, great resin pressure. So if you look at the tips of where the IV interface between the tree and the IV, there's some clear areas uh, that you can see. That isn't because uh, propozole had made it to the needles. That's because the resin pressure in these Austrian pines exceeded IV. And we actually had IVs that filled back up with resin. It counteracted, the bottle swelled up, and it pushed the product back the other way. So scratching my head, I had to figure out, and as an arborist, a uh, certified arborist, practicing arborist for as long as I have, I pretty much told Paul and I, uh, Paul Schwartz, and, and then later going up to talk to Dr. Deb McCullough, I says, if I was an arborist, I would never inject uh, an Austrian pine ever again. So we had, a, we had a little discussion, which led me to, um, and at that time, after uh, we lost uh, Dr. Fulbright, Michigan State University hired in their new um, plant pathologist, uh, Dr. Monique Sakalitis. So between uh, Deb McCullough, uh, Monique, and Dave Smitley, we kind of scratched our head and sharpened our pencil to figure out what can we do? How, 
can this work? Uh, Deb McCullough remembered a, um, a colleague in Asia that was doing a lot of research on uh, timing of treatments and experimenting with trunk injections with resinous conifers in the off season. So we actually have uh, some of that transcripts. We've had them um, translated and we realized that on a uh, resinous conifer, we kind of made a triangle. So, and I'll show you a disease triangle later, but we talked about a, a treatment triangle. And the, tri the treatment triangle came to one, uh, conifers are a tracheid vessel tree, so it means you have a very small vascular system, the xylem is very small, overlapping cells. We have a very viscous, thick product. Propiconazole is a very thick product. And we had resin, so that was our triangle. So we had to figure out what on that, what on that triangle could we eliminate to be effective. We're not going to change the physiology, the physiology of a tree. I mean, it is what it is. We are working on different compounds uh, that are still under uh, research to infuse into trees. And third, resin flow. So it came down with our research with Michigan State that we need to start to try to get product uh, compound into these trees in the off season. So my first treatment um, started off yeah, right about and right about right now is just before Halloween. I tried my first treatment off season for pitch mass borer uh, in Michigan in uh, blue spruces. Straight compound, 40 degrees, uh, soil temp still 45 or above. And I couldn't believe how easy it was to inject these blue spruces. So, like, we got something here. So now we have to eliminate resin flow. Because if you look at the uh, a, a cut end of a resinous conifer, the resin ducts flow right alongside your xylem tubes. So when you drill and access the xylem for a trunk injection, you're you're actually excavating into resin ducts. So very similar to molasses in the winter, resin doesn't flow when it's that cold. So we got the product in the xylem very quickly, very efficiently, and the treatments were done. These trees were getting treated uh, for pitch mass borer probably within uh, five to ten minutes max, which is actually pretty unheard of considering uh, all the other opportunities trials that we tried to get product into these trees. So that was my first one and we realized that we had something. Next, we, uh, we talked about Paul Schwartz and we talked about uh, Acres Golf Course. The next big thing that we're dealing with here in, is uh, the Diplodia tip blight and canker on um, Austrian pines. Uh, I was the last couple weeks uh, when they asked me to uh, host this uh, webinar I've been driving around in just about every Austrian pine uh, that I drive across out here in the Midwest and into Canada are all suffering to some degree from Diplodia tiplate. We had to come up with a solution. So my next solution was let's figure this out and then we, we, uh, we got everybody on board and we started about four years ago treating Austrian pines on the golf course, which turned out to be a pretty neat uh, research project that I got to be involved in. So a little bit of review, uh, talking about the damage uh, a canker pathogen can cause. Um, obviously the tissues to the outside of the xylem, mainly phloem and cambium, uh, below the bark can be actually killed, causing a, a girling effect. A, another is, the, you know, the bark presents a physical barrier that's extremely difficult to overcome. So that epidermis, that layer on the outside of the tree uh, we know it's very hard for a single pathogen to to get into. So they're finding out that that certain pathogens that we're going to talk about today need a point of entry. And uh, an arsenal of fungi generally is not sufficient enough to penetrate the bark into living tissue. So something has to happen. So keep that in the mind as we continue to move forward. Another uh, wounding. I think... Um, what I'm finding as we've been going through this, uh, this research project and working with Michigan State is that we're finding out that you know, there's a lot of uh, 
there's a lot of trees that we prune in the off season. Obviously, uh, elms have been pruned in the winter for a very long time. Uh, now with oak wilt spreading really bad in the Midwest, that's another tree now that we prune in the off season. I got a feeling that uh, the research is going to prove that we may have to start pruning and doing any work on conifers in the winter also. So mechanical wounds are showing uh, and pruning injuries are showing that they are entryways into the vascular system of uh, conifers and we may need to eliminate that and uh, do some of our pruning in the off season. What do trees do to fight back? Uh, I left this slide in there again. Most of these slides uh, are actually from uh, Dr. Sakalita's uh, lectures for the forestry students at Michigan State. So again, I can't give her enough credit for allowing her to use me, uh, use these on our presentation tonight. So what do trees do to fight back? Produce chemical compounds in response to wounding. Uh, and the reason I wanted to talk about that is because we talk about one, when to prune, and we look at the overall health of a tree because we're gonna get into is uh, are these plants stressed, and is that one of the, the agents of why these trees are getting infested or uh, becoming symptomatic so quickly? So is the tree healthy enough to fight back on some of these uh, fungal pathogens? Uh, another thing to keep in the back of our computer as we continue to move forward. And again, if there's any questions come up, uh, please shoot them out. If not, we'll have time at the end. Next, uh, these are a handful of things that we're dealing with on a, on a day-to-day -day basis on our evergreens. I think what's interesting is that <clears throat> the more and more that I started working on uh, conifers, the more and more on just about every one that I've seen in the urban landscape, uh, <laughs> there's something going wrong with them. So uh, I'm trying to figure out, give access to view folder. I don't know what Zach's talking about. Hopefully he sent me a text. Um, let me see. Everybody can still hear me and can see the screen? All right, let's see. Feel free to type questions. Oh, yeah, I know that. Hard to hear again. I kind of drifted away there, Dominic, but okay. Zach just wanted to... Uh, there will be a red button click. Oh, he's telling me everything I already know. Okay, let's keep going. Perfect. Uh, so here's some of the things that we're finding on a regular basis, cankers, on pines, on spruce. In the uh, bottom left-hand spruce decline, we're going to kind of wrap up on that because that's actually the next um, big problem that I'm finding in the Midwest that hopefully we can come up with some solutions. Background. Tip blight, cankers, and pines, U.S. wide. Obviously, it's a major problem in Austrian pines. Uh, been heavily planted since the 1900s. Uh, where they're starting to see more damage in nurseries, plantations, landscapes. Uh, and the disease is actually killing, deforming uh, not only seedlings, but uh, a lot of our mature trees that are in the landscape. So we talk about the host. Again, there's 20-plus pine species that can be affected in the U.S., uh, mostly exotic and native two to three needle pine, especially the Austrian. What I thought was interesting is that this is actually spreading to other plants. As we uh, typically think to Plodia Austrian, uh, there's actually a lot more um, hosts. Uh, you know, why does it matter? Obviously, most of the things that we did deal with is obviously the urban uh, tree that's been there for a long time that's starting to brown up and actually wind breaks. Um, it's spreading pretty quick, so we need, to, we need to get a handle on this. So here's a great chart uh, that was put together by Michigan State. Uh, moderately affected, we know about the Austrian, ponderosa pine. Red pine is very popular in, in the Midwest. Scots pine, jack pine, uh, occasionally spruce. We're having a problem with it affecting spruce uh, species. It's, uh, it's actually starting to affect some fir, truce fir species, and dug fir, and believe it or not, arborvitae. So when we're looking at all these other plants uh, and we see very uh, similar symptoms, uh, don't rule out diplodia on these plants also. 
Where's the distribution? Uh, like I said, I'm here. I don't know if you can see the mouse, but I'm over here in Michigan, right here. And I got a pretty good area. And if you loop in Canada, that gives me a pretty wide berth of where we're having problems with this disease. Kind of a, a, a show of the spore of the actual um, disease itself. It's pretty cool, pretty neat. We kind of spend a lot of time on that. Um, infection and spread, transmission, decimation. So we're talking about uh, a lot of other things that we talked about, rain splash, wind-driven rain, insects, uh, directly immature needles. So we, uh, we're seeing that with diplodia on immature needles where they're soft. Uh, stem tissue through stomata and wounds, and colonization above ground. So we know that this, have, this uh, will harbor above ground in sapwood, needles, and cones. And I got some good pictures of uh, some of the cones that we collected underneath uh, some of these uh, infested trees. So pinus, Austrian pine, here's your uh, disease triangle. So we know that the uh, diplodial tip blight and canker is nearby. So we have the Austrian pine. We have the diplodia, and then we have the drought, wounding events, storms, cool, wet springs. So very similar to a lot of our leaf disease, uh, this is being spread also by cool, wet springs, uh, this needle disease. So wet spring is going to lead to more uh, twig dieback and signs of this disease, diplodia. Kind of some more things we could talk about. Uh, low rain when new shoots emerge is less disease. It's kind of just the opposite. If it rains, you're going to get some. Uh, some of the other things that we're finding out, uh, high soil nitrogen, uh, competing vegetation. Uh, I think those fall in the uh, actual site health, tree health issues, which we're going to cover a little bit more on the tree health. Symptoms in the spring. Here's some good pictures. Uh, new shoots, resin dropless. Uh, the upper right picture is a perfect example of that year's growth suffering from diplodia. Uh, the other ones look a lot like Phomopsis, but when cultivated, uh, was actually diplodia. So wilted, stunted, crooked, uh, shepherd's crook, and kills current year. Mid to late summer, tire new shoots killed. So as it, as it progresses, that whole shoot can die back. And then what happens after we start losing shoots, then whole trees die back. Uh, you can kind of see on the right where this one's starting to die back. Uh, several years of infection, reduced growth, deformed trees, tree mortality. So this is a pretty serious uh, fungal pathogen. And I'm pretty excited that pretty soon I'll get to show you some of the research and how effective it was. Symptoms on the cankers, uh, developing a branch and stem. Uh, when you're looking at diplodia, don't be afraid to pull that candle out. Um, and a lot of times, if, you, uh, if it's bad enough, you'll actually see the blue-black staining in the xylem. That could be another sign uh, to lead you into exactly what's going on with that tree. Here's some of the signs of the fruiting bodies. On the needles in the, in the twigs, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to see, even the cones. Um, but a good hand lens, a good uh, little magnifying glass, and really, they really pop out really well. Uh, one of the ones that was actually pretty amazing is that um, if you look at the cones on the very bottom picture, uh, those fruiting bodies, when I, uh, at the third year, because it takes two years for a cone to develop, on the third year, the final year of the research on campus, not only were the, the trees looking amazing, is that there was no more uh, fruiting bodies even on the cones that fell off the tree. I've never seen a batch of Austrian pine cones that big, that healthy, and that beautiful to the point where I collected about 30 or 40 of them to make decorations for Christmas because they were just that beautiful, which we don't get to see very often because of the disease. So after the third year in a... It actually even affected the fruiting bodies on the cones and preserved that too. So it was pretty amazing. Again, uh, reproduction. 
uh, release fruiting bodies during wet weather, and off they go, and there's another good picture on the bottom. So obviously we have a lot of leaf litter. Um, that is a good bed for that uh, fungal patch just to sit there and wait till the following year. I know that it's uh, it's kind of, especially when uh, these trees are growing all down the ground, it's very hard to get that all cleaned up. So I'm not sure if that's a good record, you know, how much can we do on a clean a cleanup? Did you identify with the magnifying glass? Actually, my eyes are still good enough. Um, I could spot the fruiting bodies. And I was actually told that there's a lot of other fungal pathogens and that this could actually be, if you're, if there's a difficulty on to uh, figure out exactly what it is, it's very easy to culture and be identified in the lab. So if it's new in your area and you're not sure, you can actually send it to uh, your extension office and they can actually uh, uh, grow it in the lab and identify exactly what it is. And during the research for this this presentation, I kind of if you guys ever want to get a get a kick out of it, uh, just Google um, Diplodia and uh, pull up the different strains that are listed on Wikipedia. They have over a thousand strains of Diplodia listed, so it's not just one. There's over a thousand that we know of, and there's probably even more that we don't know of of strains of this fungal uh, pathogen. All right, disease cycle, overwinning, overwintering, spring affection occurs, blows over, two to three weeks death, uh, dispersed throughout the year, rainfall events, gets back on the cones, and it's just big, vicious circle. So it's very hard to interrupt this circle because there's things we can do and can't do. Uh, it's very hard to do a, a, a perfect cleanup on a site. So it's always going to be there. In an urban landscape, I think the sad thing is that you could probably do a great uh, clean up on your customer's site, but if the neighbor has the exact same problem and they don't, that uh, fungal patch is still going to be there no matter what we do. So we need to break it somehow, and my thought was, why can't we put a compound in these trees to make them uh, stronger and healthier to where they couldn't get it on its own? Hand lens, uh, we talked about that. Let me see how we're doing on time, about halfway done. Um, all right, so right now, uh, this is kind of what is being recommended by Michigan State Extension. Uh, avoid using needles, uh, cones for mulch, irrigate in the morning so this, they'll dry out faster throughout the day, um, reduce stress. Avoid pruning, shearing when raining, pruning dormant season, which we kind of talked about. Uh, another thing that they're recommending is uh, disinfecting pruning tools. I'm not sure that I've seen any research on that, on fungal pathogens and needle disease and conifers, but it it is still pretty good practice if you want to practice that just to make sure to eliminate the fact that that might be something that's going on. And then uh, another one to recommend is avoid fertiliz fertilizing ornamental and shade trees with nitrogen. So they don't want you to push uh, high nitrogen ferts to uh, shade pines, uh, which leads to increased disease. So that's what uh, we're being told right now by extension. Let's see, protect new shoots. Uh, and this is kind of what, you know, if, you, if you've been treating needle disease for a while, these are some of the compounds that we've been using. Uh, 25 years ago when I was still spraying trees, um, chlorothanophil, uh, some of this stuff, mancozeb, these were all stuff that we were using. And three to five uh, properly timed applications uh, in the springtime did help. But it was, always, uh, it was always a shoot if you could get there within that time frame and you didn't have rain uh, in between there that would uh, have a problem with uh, making your applications effective. So it kept leaning me back to there's got to be a way we can get this product in the tree. So what we did is uh, we started that, that research project on campus. And this has just been submitted uh, last year to the Journal of Arbor Culture. Uh, and it will be published this January. So you'll be able to see the whole research project. 
we went as far as not only looking at different compounds to put in these trees, not through just stem injection, but we also looked into a soil applied. Was there a systemic soil applied compound that worked well also? Uh, so we looked at a bunch of things and I'll kind of show what we did um, through the last couple of years uh, on campus to get these trees under control. Then what we did also, which is in the, in the main uh, research paper that's gonna be published, is that we did a soil sample. Not only did we do the soil sample to make sure that the trees were planted in the proper soil, uh, we did a uh, an MPK result on that. And as far as the soil that it was in, and one of the compounds that I wanted to use was a uh, a phosphorus-based uh, fungistat. But when we pulled the soil sample, phosphorus was off the charts available for the tree. So now my thought was, well, if this is something we're going to apply, and it's, uh, it's in abundance in the soil, what's missing? So then we pulled tissue samples out of the canopy and actually did an analysis on the tissue to figure out, is there something, is there a, uh, is there a, like a lock and a key that's allowing, not allowing the tree to absorb that and take care of itself, uh, which was already available to the tree. So we're working on that right now. So we're hoping that we can create an elicitor to free up those uh, compounds in the soil so this tree can actually be healthier on its own without having to use some of the other products that we're talking about. That's to come. So the first post-treatment canopy assessment. So we talked about uh, rating the trees. Obviously one to zero being beautiful, uh, looking good, very little if not any uh, signs of diplodia. And we kind of did our first assessment of the Austrian pines on a golf course, and you can kind of see where the mean was. So the trees that we treated were right between one and a half and two, according to our rating scale. Those were the ones that we were going to work on. So we have a whole different type of uh, products that we tried that we thought that may be something that could, uh, could help these trees that were all on our radar for being great uh, compounds. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that some of them did absolutely nothing. So we looked at a granular um, propiconazole, um, no results, and I don't know how it got cut off, but the untreated controls on the other side, on the right side of this graph was cut off. Uh, they're about the same as the, t uh, the tebiconazole inject and the granule uh, propazole. So the first thing that we looked at is that the injection showed the best results right off the bat. And as with either the, the straight inject, uh, which we did uh, late in the fall uh, to eliminate the resin, and same with the tree IV. So they both were the first ones to show efficacy. So we're like, oh, we got something here. So then I pitched this to the office. The office said, all right, let's continue to move forward on this and do another season. So we evaluated these over the next couple of years. Now again, uh, these were one-time applications of these compounds. So you can actually look at 15, our first evaluation. You can see where a lot of these trees were good. You can see where um, some, of the, some of the other compounds and the untreated controls pretty much stayed the same, uh, didn't get any better, didn't get any worse. But when we evaluated the trees with various compounds, you can actually see right off the bat that some of the injections and some of the soil applied products uh, were amazing that how well these trees responded and we couldn't even find any more disease or fungal uh, lesions on these trees. We had to pull uh, tissue samples down, put them under the microscope, and you can actually see the progression on the year's growth from 2015, 16, 17, and today, um, how each whirl from those years cleaned up till today, which is pretty amazing. Some of the compounds that were soil applied uh, did just as good, if not better, than the trunk injection. So that's when I was saying that we're looking at some of the compounds that may be something that's intermittent in between your, your injection of propozole. We have products that we can actually probably put in the soil interim so we don't have to inject these every year. Foliage rating, kind of the same thing. Uh, you can kind of look at some of the, the trees on campus. 
you know, really not looking that bad. But then again, they were starting to turn into more of a, um, every year getting a little bit worse. So that's why some of the uh, the treatments that we used were on some of the nutrition side of the research to see if we got the trees healthier with a soil applied product, would it work better than uh, trunk injection annually? All right, so that's pretty much on. Um, it's pretty much what we got going for uh, the Plodia. The greatest thing is that it took about five years to get to the point where we're at now. Diplodia is now on our Propozol label, and it's labeled for trunk injection. It's pretty amazing that after that, you know, the, the length of time it takes to get a research project started, the data collected, published, labels changed, uh, but that is now available, and the recommendation for treatment is pretty much now into December until we get a hard uh, frost into the soil. So as long as the... Air temp is around 40, 45 degrees in north, and same with the soil temp. You can get this product in the tree, straight product, uh, very efficiently and very effectively, and know that you're going to get two to three years of control for diplodia on those Austrian pines. So if you've got any questions on that, you can always give me a call later um, or speak with your Arbor Jet rep in your area. We can get you some more data to support uh, your decision. Last, we'll spend, uh, you know, five or ten minutes, but with everything that we learned with um, a Diplodia, we're still getting a lot of the questions on needle cast, and what's really happening now is spruce decline. It's not just blue spruce, just about all spruce in the Midwest and North. Are, um, they're leaf, they're, 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 the candles are coming out beautiful, but they're not return, retaining their inner needles. A lot of uh, initial diagnosis is it's needle cast, um, but a lot of it we don't know exactly why. So people are treating for needle cast with very little efficacy with treating this spruce decline for needle cast. So we reach back out to Monique, uh, Dr. Sakalitis with Michigan State Lab and says, hey, what are we doing? What can we do on this? So... The current state, if you look at the, uh, the newer, the, the, the evergreen or the spruce on the left compared to the right, that's what's happening. They're really starting to thin out. Uh, older trees are declining faster than younger trees because they honestly think that it's more of a um, wrong tree, wrong site, a lack of uh, what's needed in the soil for that tree to thrive as it gets older and its nutrient cycles being disrupted. Um, so... We're going to start a new project on this, and hopefully in the next couple of seasons, uh, we'll start to be able to share data on what's working for this pathogen. Uh, Todd asked, uh, what is the recommended delivery system for the, the Diplodia? I used a quick jet air, Todd. Uh, I used a quick jet air in the off season. No dilution whatsoever, straight product, and because the rates on the label were based off of exponential growth of the canopy. So you had a high rate or a low rate and a high rate for your deciduous trees. Diplodia rate is a 5 mil rate, so it's even lower than the 10 mil rate because as the product's pulled up, obviously there's less of a canopy on the top than there is on the bottom. So we're using a 5 mil rate uh, delivered with a quick jet air is what I would recommend. Great question, Todd. So current status, so what are we going to do? Now we're working on it. Um, tree decline, site changes, we're going to look into aeration. Um, a lot of these, uh, I'll be actually doing a survey on a very close uh, homeowner association that has about 100 plus blue spruces that are 25 to 30 year old, just beautiful, in the right spot, are all starting to thin out like this. So we're going to start applications this fall to hopefully have some information and some data to share with everybody by spring. So abiotic stresses, we're going to air spade some. We're going to look at soil chemistry. Uh, we're going to look at, um, not only are we going to look at the spruce decline, we're going to look at in, insect uh, pressure. Is there a secondary pathogen on this? So not only is it 
uh, a fungal pathogen, what else is causing these trees to get stressed out to a point where they're losing all these needles? A couple more pictures. Uh, like I said, initially it follows needle casts, symptoms, then it ends up upward and into the crown, and the trees decline and die. So here's a tree that within two years uh, is getting to the point where it could possibly be a removal. And even farther. So we're looking at these trees. Obviously, these leaves look like they were probably never taken care of from day one. And where it's at is probably a removal. But it would be a great tree to uh, start using for a research plot. We're going to look at cankers. Um, is there a spruce? Cytospora canker. Uh, we're going to be looking for needle cast. Um, and actually, we're not only needle cast, we're going to be looking at stigmenia. So there's three pathogens, and the fourth one is actually Phomopsis. So on the initial um, evaluation by Dr. Sakalitis out in the, in the field is that all the trees that were struggling and looked the worst, she found all four of these pathogens on the tree. So we may, we may know that is, that is that the common link? It takes all four of these pathogens for the trees to die. Is it one more than the other? Uh, we just don't know. Uh, but then in 2011, we, uh, through some DNA testing, they started looking at some of the cankers and did some of the canker, and they did some DNA testing on the cankers. So this is kind of a revolutionary breakthrough that at first it was being uh, classified as a phomopsis. Um, they changed the name. But through DNA testing, and this is a pretty neat uh, slide, and because of uh, the, in, the intense testing and all the codes that come out, you can see that diaporte, which is a new pathogen, very similar to the Phomopsis, is showing up on all the trees that are very, very weak. So we may be onto something here, and this could be the... Uh, the fungal patches that's actually causing the spruce trees to decline. So stand by on that. So hopefully we're onto something, and this could be help with uh, this could help with uh, prescribing a treatment in the future. These are where we found it. This is just in Michigan where she did it. Um, both species widespread, and that pathogen is just about all over the state of Michigan. So again, we're going to look into this a little bit deeper. Um, host susceptibility, Colorado blue spruce, uh, the Norway spruce on, on campus are struggling, white spruce, black spruce. So the Norway white and black that we planted to, uh, in the last 20 years to eliminate overplanting of the blue spruce, uh, they're all getting it now too. So we really need to figure this out before it gets out of hand, so hopefully we don't lose a lot of these evergreens or conifers. So right now, best management practice, because there is no treatment for it, uh, Alternative species for new plantings, we tried that, but they're getting it. Uh, good, well-drained airflow through the site, uh, space to get adequate airflow. Um, chemical, nursery age and younger trees, good control with uh, clearies. Uh, not so much on the older, mature trees in the, um, the landscape. Uh, pruning out disease branches may slow decline, remove de de uh, debris, but again, be careful on rainy days. Um, it's a disease of mature landscape trees. Current control measures aren't working, so the ongoing work is focused on managing this disease in the trees. So this is our next big uh, problem that we're going to have in the urban landscape. And I uh, just want you guys to know that we're, uh, we're going to put a lot of resources in this to see if we can figure out what's going on as soon as we can. Again, uh, a little shout-out uh, to Dr. Sakalitis. Uh, she has an extension... Um, position. Uh, she's very receptive to phone calls. If you guys have any questions whatsoever, uh, please reach out to her. Here's her website, uh, her email address, and her phone. I'll leave that up for a couple minutes if you want to write that down. Again, if you're in the Midwest and you've got questions and you didn't get a chance to write it down, uh, reach out to me and I'd be more than happy to share this with you. Uh, and that's pretty much all I got. Um, Again, uh, Arbor Jet Joe, I'm in the field. Uh, I spend most of my time doing research uh, and playing around with this. Uh, 
One of the neatest things that I'm being asked to do right now is that hemlock woolly adelgid is actually spreading into Canada. And I'll be spending a lot of time in Nova Scotia. So if any of you guys are in that area of the country, let me know. I'll take you out to dinner. Um, and that's kind of all I got. We've got a question pop up. Let me see if I tip. All right. And uh, we'll leave it on this one. So it gives you an idea of your support that you guys got out there. Uh, when it comes to evergreen diseases, if you guys want to, make sure you give me a call and let me know. Uh, uh, email me or send me some questions. Um, great question by Greg. Are previous webinars archived on ArborJet's website? Yes. All the ones that we recorded are on there. Uh, I believe they're putting them not only on YouTube, but they are archived on ArborJet. Uh, website. If you have a hard time locating them, let one of us know and we'll guide you through the uh, tabs to find them. Yeah, everything that we've done so far, we've recorded. So everything's available to you guys in the past. Um, and that's all I got for you guys. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, again, I got, I got a passion for uh, evergreens and conifers. It was kind of interesting when I first started this, no one wanted to do anything with it because like, ah, it's, they're a pain in the butt, but and when we look at it, there's probably more conifers in North America than there are deciduous trees. So hopefully we can uh, preserve as many as we can uh, to the people that want us to preserve them. So I thank you guys for tuning in. 